You may be thinking that you've stumbled onto a modern version of Hamlet, but actually, with the help of our friend here, we'll be discussing the relative positions of the mandibular and mental foramina from infancy to adult edentulousness and their implications when administering inferior alveolar and mental nerve blocks. Isn't that right? <laughs> Welcome back, my dudes and dudettes. So, changes in the relative anatomical positions of the mandibular foramen and the mental foramen over time. Now, why is this important? Well, by understanding where the foramina are most likely to be according to the developmental stage of our patient, we're able to improve our anesthesia block technique, reducing the margins of error so that you don't have to stick your patient twice. In this video, we'll be discussing the relative positions of the mandibular foramina postnatally. At birth, the locations of the mandibular and mental foramina are points which are both fixed in future stages of development relative positions also change over time. Confusing? Well, yes and no. Let's take a quick look at this copy of an adult mandible borrowed from our friend here. As you can see, the mental foramen more or less opens where the alveolar process of the mandible meets the body of the mandible, typically along the vertical axis of the lower second premolar. In adult edentulousness, the mental foramen will have maintained its position at this junction. However, Due to the resorption of the alveolar process, its relative position will have shifted from the midline to a more superior position closer to the margin of the resorbed alveolar ridge. As such, it will have retained both a fixed and a relative shifted position over time. And what about the mandibular foramen? Its position is more or less fixed within the ramus, midway between the mandibular angle and the condyle, just under two thirds distance from the coronoid notch to the posterior aspect of the ramus. We'll now consider these over specific periods of development, beginning with the infant mandible. The mandible is small at birth with a short ramus. The position of the mandibular foramen will be just under two-thirds distance from the coronoid notch to the posterior border of the ramus at the level of the alveolar ridge midway between the mandibular angle and the condyle. The needle is inserted between the pterygomandibular ligament and the ascending border of the mandible, as it is in all ages. However, it will have to be given at the level of the alveolar ridge up until six years of age. The mental foramen opens beneath the socket of the first deciduous molar, where the alveolar process of the mandible meets the body of the mandible. However, this is below the vertical midline of the mandible, as future bone depositions on the inferior aspect of the corpus mandibulae, that is the body of the mandible, have yet to occur. Under the influence of the condylar growth center, the postnatal condyle grows in an upwards and backwards direction, lengthening the ramus vertically. Additional bone is deposited along the posterior aspect of the ramus, with subsequent resorptive growth along its anterior edge, in order to keep pace with the posteriorly moving condyle. The upwards and backwards growth of the ramus results in a downward and forwards growth of the body of the mandible. And while the condylar growth center is responsible for the upwards and backwards elongation of the ramus, it is not responsible for the growth of the entire mandible. Remember that as a part of the TMJ, the condyle undergoes compressive loading, which is why its growth structure is endochondral. The growth structure of the rest of the mandible, however, is intramembranous, with growth and remodeling mediated by localized growth sites. As a result of the upwards and backwards growth of the ramus with the subsequent downwards and forwards growth of the body of the mandible, during the course of mixed dentition, approximately ages 6 to 12, the mandibular foramen will have shifted from the level of the occlusal plane midway between the mandibular angle and the condyle, just under two-thirds distance from the coronoid notch to the posterior board of the ramus, therefore injections will need to be given at this level. The mental foramen, beneath the first deciduous molar, still where the body of the mandible meets the alveolar process above it, will have shifted near to the vertical midline per the bony depositions on the inferior aspect of the corpus mandibulae. As mentioned earlier, these foramen shifts are relative shifted positions over periods of time 
and not physical migrations as such. It's not like they decided to move from one location to another just to make local anesthesia administration more complicated for us. And now that you know the reasons for and the effects on the topographical locations of the mandibular foramina, the location of local anesthesia administration should now seem somewhat less complicated and nothing which can't be perfected with a little practice over time. Of course, we're not quite done yet. We still need to consider what happens to these foramina during adolescence, adulthood, and beyond. The width of the mandible tends to be mostly established by adolescence, with small increases in the molar and bicondylar widths as the mandible grows in length. Growth in length and height continues throughout adolescence, that is puberty, with vertical growth height continuing to the late teens in women and the early 20s in men. From the age of 12 until the degenerative processes of edentulousness, the mental and mandibular foramina are located in what most clinicians would consider their normal positions, with the mental foramen in the vertical midline of the mandible, often between the first and second lower premolar, but most often along the longitudinal axis of the lower second premolar. For the mandibular foramen, the local anesthesia insertion point may no longer be considered directly in relation to the occlusal plane. Extraorally, the mid-distance between the palpable condyle and the mandibular angle may be used as a vertical reference point, while intraorally, the coronoid notch, that is the greatest concavity on the anterior border of the ramus, may be used as a horizontal reference point. Studies estimate that the mean distance from the coronoid notch to the mandibular foramen range between 14.5 millimeters plus or minus 3 millimeters to 19 millimeters plus or minus 2 millimeters with the latter representing stages of mixed dentition onwards. The injection point for the inferior alveolar nerve block will be between the coronoid notch and the pterygomandibular ligament within the pterygotemporal depression. However, the various techniques used and the characteristics of the anesthetics shall be covered in a later video, so don't forget to subscribe. So, what happens when the mandible begins to undergo edentulousness? While studies are still inconclusive, increases which do occur in the angle of the mandible are thought to follow Wolf's Law, whereby changes in the ramus are likely due to the loss of masticatory forces. In other words, form follows function. The relative location of the mandibular foramen remains the same, however, and the same extra and intraoral references and distances may be used as shown on the adult mandible. The mental foramen, however, is a different story. Recall from our friend's mandible here that when the regional dentition is intact, the mental foramen more or less opens where the alveolar process of the mandible meets the body of the mandible, typically along the longitudinal axis of the lower second premolar. In the case of edentulousness, however, after the resultant resorption of the alveolar bone, the mental foramen will now be located close to the superior margin of the resorbed alveolar ridge, which is where our injection point will now be. So, to quickly recap, from infant to adult edentulousness, the mental foramen seemingly migrates in an upwards direction from below the vertical midline of the mandibular body to its superior margin in adult edentulousness, while the mandibular foramen also seemingly migrates in an upwards direction, starting at the level of the alveolar ridge. Roll the underscored montage. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I did. If you found this video insightful, leave a like and be sure to subscribe for further Duden content. All video ideas are welcome in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and remember, if you dent, do dent.